Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so we've waited long enough. Uh, yeah, we've waited long enough. Okay, so I'm very happy to have Muli here for this week. So I think his schedule still has some spaces. Um, but anyway, you could probably grab it. Uh, it's always fun. Okay, off we go, Muli. Okay. Tell us about your adventures in California. Okay, thanks. So I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be here to visit you guys. I've been visiting uh, some long visit. This is a short visit. I'm going to try to uh, talk about today about uh, work which I have done in California and in my sabbatical and actually it's a work with uh, many authors but in fact the guy who really did the work is a student as always and, and if you want to, I'm, I'm going to try to uh, tell you as much as I can but in fact you should look into his thesis and it's publicly available and it contains all the material proofs, many many more experiments and other things. And my own research interest uh, in, uh, is a sort of static analysis, shape analysis, verifying properties of, of uh, low-level data structures. But in fact, during my sabbatical at Stanford, I mainly did some other things. And in particular, this is what I'm going to talk today, is, is uh, how do you actually compile from a high-level language into a low-level language. So for example, take a language like, like Python and compile from it into C. And I think I can do a good job in this. So how do you compile from a very uh, high-level language into a low-level language? And in particular, I'm interested in the uh, how do you compose the operation? And I'm, 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 I'm being vague about what does it mean to compose data structures. But in fact, I, I think there are many uh, meaningful ways to compose data structures. And another thing that uh, I've been involved in, it's actually related to that, is that People are trying to get concurrent programming to work, as, you, as we all know. But the issue is that, and people have developed, like uh, Doug Lee and others, have developed very smart libraries for concurrent programming. But that's not enough. And I will, I will show you, but I'm sure you understand. And the issue is how do you help people to actually make this concurrent programming work? So we know that, in fact, if you look, there's many, many sophisticated data structures and they are nice, like Java, C Sharp. They all produce these very nice uh, 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 pro uh, data structures. And they, they usually simplify programming, and they also increase the level of abstraction. And the idea is that you want to hide things like logs, other things that are hidden in the data structure. So this is all nice, but in fact, it's not as nice as you think. And when you try to use it, you see that it's very hard to use these data structures. And, and my feeling is that this has to do with composition again, that it's very hard to compose it. And I'm going to give you a few examples. And I, uh, uh, in fact, during this work, we actually have done other work about very, very fine disk things. And you will see that, in fact, there are many bugs that people have when they try to use these data structures. By the way, in, ask questions, because I, I, I always get so fast, even faster than I think. So, <laughs> so please ask questions, and you'll help me out. Or tell me that I'm going too slow or whatever. Tell me something. So this is just to give you a, a sort of a concrete motivation. This is an, an example that, in fact, was verified uh, with shape analysis by uh, Bill McCloskey. And it's a, it's a very, very small web server. It's a, I think it's the smallest, uh, as far as I know. It's written in C, a few thousand lines of C program. But it's still tricky. What it has, it's maintained these connections. And then there is another link list, which is the map, which is the connection. And you see several connections actually can have uh, uh, the same entry. And there is also a reference count. You see that here, for example, this guy has a reference count zero. It means it can be released. And then there is also, on top of it, there is this table, there is this array. And the array is actually using, used for direct access into this link list. So there's link list and array, and they are joined together. So it's not just the complexity of the individual data structure, it's how they are, in, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are they, they, they are interrelated. And you see there is a lot of sharing going on. And if, if, if you want to think in terms of invariant, 
you will see that there are a lot of tricky things going on here. So for example, here the idea is that when I enter the table and I, when I enter through the index, they, 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 they are inverse. Okay, so I can go from the table to the index and I can go from the index to the table. Another property that I said that the reference count always holds the right number, uh, counts the number of incoming edges. So these are properties, these are invariant that you want to maintain. And you can verify them with shape analysis, but it gets tricky. Why does it get tricky? I'm just showing you a, a very, very simple uh, part of the code. So what happened here is that you see that here, this invariant is actually broken, and later on it is restored. And this is common. Small invariants are broken and restored, and, 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 and even if the individual data structure are correct, you can get, things can get problematic. Maybe I give you a more uh, sort of example that is, uh, uh, has to do with Java. So this is, a get, this is a, uh, taken from Tomcat version, uh, version 5. So what happened is you see there's a, there's a hash map which is used, and there is a lock which is used, and you use this contain key. And you if you find the key, you do this get and, and, uh, and remove. These are all invocation of the API. They are the invocation of the collection. So what happened when they moved to version 6? So the environment, in fact, that is maintained here is that remove attribute returns the value which is removed, or it returns null if this uh, value doesn't exist. Now what happened, look, look what they did when they moved to Tomcat version 6. So what did they do? They said, oh, that's great. We have this concurrent hash map. That will provide this beautiful data structure. It's concurrent. We can do this. We can remove the synchronize and we are done. What do you guys think? <laughs> Oops, exactly. That's not going to work. <coughs> In fact, so basically somebody can, because even though the individual data structure are correct, the problem is the interaction between them. So what happened is that now I have this ATTR put and ATTR remove, and as a result I'm returning O and I'm breaking, breaking the invariant. This is no longer linearizable. And if you ask if this is common, I encourage you to read our Opsula paper because it actually shows that 40% of the real, real code actually have this kind of things. And after this, uh, this uh, after when we submitted this paper, it was published. It's interesting because apparently now people are trying to change Java to avoid it. So, so, so the question is how? What, what I'm trying to understand is how can I avoid these bugs as opposed to find this bug? How can I try to avoid them? And I have several solutions. They are not optimal, but I encourage you to 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 look at them. Maybe I give you another example. Before, before I go, so this is a, uh, again taking from Tomcat. So what's going on here? Here again, there is a there is a data structure, and in fact, the, the you see that in fact it, it's uh, the data structure represents something like a cache, and you can you can actually put it in the long term or short term, and the operation to put in the lo uh, uh, to put uh, in the long term and the short term they are correct, and the, but the environment that you want to see, you Sorry, the environment that you want to maintain is that every element that is added is either added to the uh, add-in or added to the long term. But again, when you go to the concurrency, this environment is broken because somebody in the middle of it can actually insert an operation that breaks this environment. So the issue, and of course you can say I can wrap it with a lock, but once you wrap it with a lock, you, you broke all the concurrency. Okay, so what do you do? So we have here several solutions. I'm going to show you them, and, and I'm going to show them start by, by analyzing sequential programs, and later on I will talk to you about how, how I add concurrency. So I'm, I'm going to uh, use throughout this, this, this talk, I'm going to use a very simplified example, but it's a real example. It's taken from the Linux file system. Windows probably have something similar. Uh, so what happened here is that you see I have several linked lists which are somehow intertwined together. There's the file system, and each for the file system, there is a, every file in the file system, there is another linked list, and here, and there's also a linked list of the files which are in use, and there's another linked list which are the files which are not in use. And they're all intertwined together. And you can ask yourself, why did the Linux people do it? Are they crazy, or the Windows people, or whatever? So the answer is no, they're not crazy. They, are, they care about efficiency. And they want to make sure that the, that, that the accesses are efficient enough. So, for example, here, if you want to maintain this access pass of find all the mounted file system, you go over this one linked list. If you want to maintain the cache files of each of the file system, you go on the second linked list. 
And if you want to iterate over all used and unused files in list recently used, then you see that you go to this one linked list here and this other linked list here. So they maintain this list recently used. And why is it, why is it like this? Because they want to maintain something like cache or like memory things. that They, they, evict, they evict something from the memory when they don't need it. So that's, that's the, the file system example. So if you think about it, it's great. It's correct. It's efficient. But for us, from, for, from a programming analysis or for verification, it's a nightmare. Because it has this, this very, very complex data structure. We look at it, you say it's, it's several linked lists which are intertwined somehow. And, and another thing which is problematic about it, and even the Linux people observe it, is that it's really hard to change this kind of things. If they want to insert new law, if they want to insert something, if they want to change something, it's really, really hard. They are stuck with this very, very low, low level representation. And this research asks the question, can you do something different? So, and since I'm here, I have to talk about specification. And there are ways that you can try to specify it and people are trying separation logic, first order logic, monadic, second order logic, other things. They are complex. And I'm going to try to give you something which I think is simpler, hopefully. So what is the high level idea? The high level idea is very simple. I look into this file system. And I say, what does it actually represent? In some conceptual level, it's just a database. At some conceptual level, it's just a table. You see, it's the table of the file system, the file, and the in use. And basically, there are these three columns. This is what it represents. How it's represented is an issue of efficiency, of course. But this is what is represented here. It's, it's, it's something very simple. It's, it's basically a database with a single table. There is something that I have to tell you, and it will be very important when it's come to sharing. I have to respect certain functional dependencies. So in this example, what happened is that I have to know that the file system and the file determines the in-use. OK? That's a very important property, and it will be important when I talk about sharing. So for example, I don't want to allow this kind of thing. You see that here, 2.5 is mapped to true, and 2.5 is mapped to false. I don't want to allow that, and I want to the programmer to specify that as a global environment to say what functional dependencies in the table are there. So this is what I do here. I, 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 I have this functional dependency. And what does it mean? It means that element here, if you think in terms of the data structure, is either in this, in this, in this one linked list or in the other linked list. <coughs> and this is important. Functional dependency will be very important when I talk about sharing. So, so I'm going to allow the programmer to specify these functional dependencies. Now, how do I go from the relation to the table? So I observed several things. So one thing that I observed is that I can abstract the individual containers. So for example, linked list is just a container. Tree is just a container. So this is a, this example that you see that now I have this file system. And now I represent it. You see, there, this, is, this is the whole relation. And there is this first file system. There is the second file system. And in the first file system, there is the first file, the second file, and the third file. And in the second file system, there is this first file and second file. And this represents essentially the same thing. The interesting thing is that there is another view of the same relation. So there is a, a second view of the same relation that I can go through the in-use. And I can say, look, oh, the same relation can be used that I can take the in-use true, and I can in-use false. And in the in-use true, so this is again a container of the whole relation. And then there is another container which says which are the elements which are a member of the in-use true, and which are the elements which are a member of the in-use false. So this is the container. And the most interesting thing that, in fact, I can draw them together. I can jam them together. So this is what's going on here. This, this is this single relation, which represented in two ways. It's represented either as, a, as, a, as, a, as this file system, or it's represented as this in use. And again, you see that here I'm using the functional dependency. Because if this functional dependency would not be correct, this would not be possible to, to represent it that way. OK? So that's the high level idea. And what, what it, from that, I can conclude that there is a way that I can let the programmer specify how to lay out data structure. So how does it work? Yes? So you're assuming here that the order in these lists is not relevant? Uh, that's a tricky thing. So, so in some point, so there's the different things. For that point, for, for, for this point, I assume it's not relevant. 
But later on, I can insert them, like in the database. that people say the terrorist revelation, you abstract the order, but in this case, for example, for in-use and the unused, it is important. So our implementation actually supports the fact that you can say whether something is ordered or unordered, like databases. So we do support this kind of thing. Okay, so from that observation actually comes the idea of, 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 of what we call decomposing the relation. And this is the main sort of contribution of this work, is that basically we have a way to specify how to lay out the data structure. And this is this DAG, this directed acyclic graph. It actually shows you how you lay out this data structure. So this blue node here represents the whole relation. And then there is a column FS, which is implemented as a linked list, it doesn't matter. But this represents all the other, the remaining subrelation. If you want to think in database, this is an operation that people call group by. You take something and you project a certain column and you find what it is. And then there is another way that you can represent the in use. And from that, this subrelation, it has this file, which is again implemented as a linked list. And this, in the, in the, in the leaves here, there is the in use value. So this is what the programmer specified. This is, a, a, if you want to think, a type descriptor. It describes how you compose these shared relations. Okay, so it's a, it's a way that to, to, to describe how you compose these shared relations. Okay, so that's what's going on. Let me show you that in, a, in, a, in an example. So you see that I have a table. This is a concrete table. And I can take the FS. So I take this FS guy. So what I have, I have two subrelations. You see, this is the subrelation here which corresponds to the first file system and the subrelation which corresponds to the second file system. And, and once again, when I'm here, I can say I can take this file uh, uh, subrelation. So I take this file, I have this subrelation which remains, which is the in-use relation, and then I take another file, I have the in-use relation. So this I show you how the left branch is implemented. Now we observe something, that once I do that, in fact the context of this table is not important. The only meaningful information is only at the leaves. At the top here, this information is not necessary, so I can obstruct it that way, and I haven't lost any information. So this is how I go from the high level representation to the low level representation. I can also do it on the right hand side. Again, I do this projection by the in use, so I project this relation by the in use, I get the FSN file, so that's what happened here. I get this in use true, this is the FSN file, I get this in use false, it's the FSN file. And now I take this FSN file and I get this, this, this subrelation. Here you notice there is something which is potentially confusing. Okay, because what happened is you see I, go, I got the in use and I ended up with in use. And you say why is it even correct? And in general it's not correct, but what, what is the thing that is helping me? The functional dependency, exactly. The fact that I have the functional dependency, I know what I do and I know exactly how they are present. And once again, once, I, once I, I, I have this information, then again I can, I can abstract all the, the tables in the middle, only the, the information they leave is important, and I can present it at, at the right hand side. And if you, go, if you combine them together, then you see that how we go from this decomposition into what we call the composition instance. So you see that this is the composition, it's a, it's a shape descriptor, it's a descriptor of all the memory, and this is a decomposition instance, it's a description of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the concrete memory that you have. So this is, this is kind of a type descriptor, and this is what is represented by this type. So you see that there are two instances of the blue, of the, of, uh, sorry. So you see these are the in use true and in use false, these are the individual file, and they are all represented by this decomposition instance. Okay, and if you are familiar with our, and, 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 and this is basically just a representation of the memory, ignoring the individual layout of the containers. And if you think in terms of our work in shape, shape analysis, it's actually very, very similar. It's not very much different. We used to call them summary node. It's, it's not very different. It's basically the idea that you take the memory, you partition it to, in, some, in some meaningful way, and you, you see how it's, how it's related to each other. So this is what's going on. And once you do that, then the question is how do you choose the, the, indivi the individual data structure for the container? So what happened is that we, have, we, 
again, we specify that there is this linked list. So we specify this linked list. You see that this is how it's implemented as linked list. We specify that this container is linked list. Then you see it's also implemented as linked list. We specify it as array. So you see that here you have a one bit for use in use and the in use true and in use false. And you have the speci you specify that this is a linked list. So you map it into linked list. So this way we can map from the high level data structure into the low level data structure. So that's what's happened. The programmer specified this shape descriptor, and we can actually map automatically into the lower level data structure and show, and, and, in, and in this case, synthesize combination of shared data structures. Okay, so that's how it goes. It is not, as, as, I, as I hinted, it's not completely as trivial as I said, because not every decomposition is actually valid. And the composition is valid if it's or accurate if it represents every, every possible relation in the, in the relational specification. So what happened in the paper, we enforce sufficient condition for adequacy. They are very, very simple, and they are based on the functional dependency. So and I, will, I will tell you the main idea, but it's, it's rather simple. And the idea is when you merge node, you have to make sure that the, the values agree. So let me give you this by example. The idea is we want to make, make sure that all columns are represented and the nodes are consistent with functional dependency. In particular, when you have columns which are bound to different passes in the DAG, they must functionally determine each other. And this is something that we can check at compile time and it's, it's actually checked in linear time. We can check it in linear time that the composition is valid. So for example, this is something which is not valid. Why is it not valid? For the Linux file system, this is not valid. Exactly, because the file, you don't know what's the file system, or if you think in terms of our system, the file does not determine it in use. If you put the file in the FS, then it becomes valid, because the file in the FS determines the in use. And with the functional dependency, we can just check it. So the, if you, and, and our system basically, ch yes? So at the beginning, the, you didn't put a functional dependency saying that the file determines the file system, just because, or it's not true? If the programmer tells me that it's true, uh, uh, I don't understand you. I'm, I'm, I'm trusting you, the programmer, that you know the functional dependency. Okay, but if you think the actual memory representation. Okay. If I give you a file. Okay. You, I mean, okay, not in constant time, but you can scan every file system and see where that file lives, in which file system it lives. Okay. And it will be unique. You, you, are, you are talking about runtime? You, you have the table or you don't have the table? I don't know. I mean, I have the, the, the low-level representation. I mean, no, but I, I'm, I'm synthesizing the low-level representation. I'm, I'm, I'm going from the table into the low-level representation. Right, but it, you could add to your table another functional dependency. Okay. That said that the file determines the file system. Yeah, sure. And the existing concrete representation would still be okay, right? Yeah. And then this would be a valid decomposition. Correct, correct. It's all with respect to... It's, I, I, it's all with respect to the functional dependency. And at the moment, I should say, I'm making an assumption that the programmer obeys the functional dependency. There's a separate issue. How do you prove that the relation, I think it's actually something which is nice and we can prove it. But there's a separate issue. When you write work with program resolutions, how do you prove that the, 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 uh, the, the functional <coughs> dependencies are maintained? And there's an other issue which I have no idea how to say. How do you specify the functional dependency? It depends on what you have. But we, if you specify them, we can verify them. At the moment, I'm assuming they are obeyed. So, so that is correct. Again, a more interesting case is the adequacy when it's sharing. You see that there, there are two passes in this directed asynchronous graph. And in fact, they are valid because you see that these two passes, they determine each other. Because what happened here, FS and file determine the in use and FS and file. And in using FS and file depend, determines FS and file because this is determined by the functional dependency. But of course, if, for example, you, you don't have the file system here, the file here, then in fact the system will complain. And it's always with respect to the, to the given uh, uh, functional dependencies. So that's what's going on. We check it. If you want to think in terms of aliasing, what happened is that the decomposition is actually a restriction on, on what aliasing is going on. And this will be, of course, very important when we go to concurrency. Because that's basically, we limited the way that you can have uh, sharing. 
in some sense, you can have sharing within, data, within the data structure, and, and, but the sharing is somehow limited. And in particular, you think in terms of the passes in the heap, we can determine where are the, for example, here, there is exactly, a, there is exactly two passes to this guy. And that's very important, and we will see when we talk about concurrency that this is important. So what we describe in the PLDI 11 paper, we describe, Peter has a, a compiler that actually compiles, if you, if you want, to, for, for a language with relations into a language with low level data structure. So it basically takes this idea and you specify this, the, the relational data structure. You also specify the decomposition if you are the data structure designer and our compiler generates C++ code. So for example, you write this relational specification uh, you write this, uh, uh, you see, you write this fs and uh, file and in use, fs and file determine the in use, and then you write a loop here, you write queries, and it's mapped uh, uh, automatically to the low level implementation. And it uses the linked list implementation of the C++. It's actually, and it's, it uses also the specified graph decomposition. So we generate the C++ code. It's uh, rather simple, but in fact, there are still some interesting things. So for example, Look how we map, how we compile this thing. We basically, we have this DAG, and we are trying to, to have an heuristic which de determine what is the most efficient way to do it. So for example, here, we can do this scan, and we can do this scan, and our heuristic tells us that the cost is propor proportional to the number of files. We can take the other side, to take the access and take the scan, and this tells us that the cost is proportional to the number of files in use. So we prefer the second one, because it has a cheaper cost. And of course, we cannot guarantee anything in theory, but in practice, we guarantee that we get something as good as what the programmer does and sometimes better. Okay? So this is what we do here. In a, when you do update, it's a little bit more tricky because remember, we have shared representation, but the fact that we have directed a cyclic graph, it, it helps us because what happens is that now we can have a cut through this graph. And as long as we have a cut, we can, remove the, the, we can guarantee that the element is removed. For example, look, here I'm removing this first file system, so I'm, do, I'm removing them from the, I'm removing this file system from, from this linked list, but this is not enough, of course, because it doesn't have the cut. I also have to remove it from the in use, and this way I have a cut on the, 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 on the decomposition. And, and when I, when I have a cut on this decomposition, I can guarantee that, in fact, I, re, I, I, I eliminated the, the file, and you see that now I, sorry, I eliminated the file system, and you see that now I have only the second file system with its use, and I have a consistent representation. So this is how the compiler generates code, and there is a theorem that says if the, comp if the programmer obeys the relational specification, so as I said, I'm not actually verifying that, and if the representation is adequate, but this is something that we can algorithmically check that it's adequate, and if the individual containers are correct, and this is something we can check with, 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 uh, with, with Slayer or TVLA, but that's a separate issue, if they, the individual containers are correct, then we can guarantee that the generated uh, low-level code maintains the relational abstraction. Okay, so this is how it goes. You have this memory state. You apply, you apply this low-level operation. You abstract it. You get this relation. And in fact, it's the same relation which is represented. So the diagrams commute. So we, we prove that in fact it is correct, and it's correct by construction. But now comes the interesting part of the talk. How do we do concurrency? And that's much more tricky. And why is it much more tricky? Because in the Linux file system, it is concurrent, and you, there are many, many ways that you can do this concurrency. In particular, what's, if you look what's going on there, there's different mechanisms for locking, and the, it's difficult to write them and to, to reason about them. It's hard to choose the correct granularity of locking. For example, you can lock the whole thing, or you can, you can, you can do this, uh, so other things. And as I said, even when you have these concurrent containers, it's really hard to use them correctly. And obviously there is a trade-off. You can do this fine-grained locking. It's more complex, of coarse-grained locking. Fine-grained locking is more scalable. Uh, coarse-grained locking has a lower overhead, but, uh, but it's easier to uh, reason about, and it's easier to change. So the question is, what do you want? And, and in particular, when we talk about concurrent containers, they, they, they are really hard to write, but as I said, in fact, most of the time you actually don't need to write them. Because if you work in a language like C-sharp or Java, 
there's already many reasonable, excellent concurrent containers. So the question is, you don't need to, to write them. Instead, you need to use them somehow. And as I say, composing them is tricky. And it's usually not safe to update containers in parallel. And lock association is tricky. And as I said, in, program, in, in practice, and that's I'm referring to the paper by Rohad Shaham, it's actually really, really hard to use them correctly. So what do we do in the PLDI 12 paper? We take our approach of decomposition. We say, look, look we, can always do we can already do a reasonable job in generating these sequential low-level programs. Why can't we do the same for concurrent? And in fact, it turns out we can do better. At least in our comparison to people, we do better. And I'll show you how. So what do we do? We take this verification. We move to Scala. I don't even know why. But uh, 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 we, 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 we generate things in Scala, and we use the JVM. Uh, so, so what happens is you have this concurrent decomposition. And the concurrent decomposition, you see, it specifies the log. And, it's, and you will see that also it specifies the, the so the program has specified the locks, and we will generate a code which is provably correct using these locks. And by provably correct, I mean that it's serializable and it's deadlock free. Maybe not the most efficient, but I'll show you that in practice it's efficient enough. So that's how it goes. And how does it go? It's similar to the idea of the decomposition. You basically describe how to, dis to represent the relation using concur con con concurrent containers and lock. And the concurrent decomposition specifies the choice of the container and also the number of placement of locks and which locks protect which data. So you see that here, for example, this is concurrent hash map, this uh, dotted line, and this is tree map. And now you see these locks. And, and this gives you a specification. How do you protect p different pieces of the memory? So, and we have an interface like in the sequential, which I have not described, but it's kind of simple, empty, query and remove. Insert is slightly more tricky because we want to maintain something like put if absent. So we support something like the interface of put if absent. So basically, insert doesn't change the table when, the value, when there is already something which has the part R. But it's, it's, it's kind of standard. But we support this interface, so the programmer writes this interface, and from it we will generate the, co the correct concurrent container. And what do we verify? We verify serializability. So serializability means that you can order the operation in a way that from outside it looks the same. OK? So this is the notion of, of, of serializability. And, and, so, and how do we verify serializability? Usually it's very tricky. But what we do, we follow the, the, the ideas in the database. We enforce much more strict, uh, uh, stricter restriction. So what we do is we use this idea of two-phase locking. We attach lock to each piece of the data. And we do this two-phase. So basically, in two phases, it means that to perform the read, we first lock. Either read or write, we, we first lock the element. And, and we, never, we never access an element until, uh, 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 unless it is locked. And the all lock acquisition, we guarantee that they precede the lock release. So that, that's, again, that's a, idea, a very old idea implemented in a database, databases, and it was proved in the, 90, in the 70s that well lock two phase are serializable. So that's great. It looks like we are done. OK, so we have this two phase. We attach a lock to, to every edge. Uh, two phase locking guarantees serializability. And it looks like we are done. But is it true? Probably not, if I'm asking that. So, so, so the answer is not exactly, because some com there are some complications. First of all, it's not clear how to attach lock to a container. Container, remember, it's a linked list or whatever. It's not clear how to, to attach a lock to a container. Second, in practice, it's not going to work because if you assi even if you find a way, it's not going to scale. You don't want to have all of these locks. And in theory, it, it will also will not work because what happened is that, you remember, this represents an unbounded representation. The programmer can decide to have a new ed edge. So I don't necessarily have to protect the, the edges which exist. I have to, uh, to, uh, to protect the edges that will exist. OK? Because edges will come uh, as, the, as the program goes. So that's not going to gonna work. So we're going to do uh, something more conservative. We're going to attach the locks to the node. We're going to limit concurrency even further. We're going to attach the locks to the node. And you see here, 
these locks are attached to the node and from the edges we have a map to the node and this we call it placement and it maps the, 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 the locks to the, to the corresponding node. What the nice thing about it is that we can support different levels of concurrency. So for example, you see here I can do cross-grain concurrency, it means that I map everybody to the same node. I can also do fine-grain concurrency in a, that I can map, you see I can map something, or at least fine air grain, in a sense that you see that this is mapped to this other node. I can even do something which people call log scripting because they care about efficiency. They have these ideas that they, that they have, for example, several number of logs, like, like 12 logs, and then I can do this. You see that I do this, I use this mod operation that in fact, I, I, here I have these four logs and I'm using this mod four to determine which is the log. And the idea is again, I, I want to have small number of logs and I want to, to reduce the contention. So this is what's going on. I have to require a certain requirement because it simplifies the life of the compiler. So, so I have to require that the logs dominate the edges that they protect. They protect. So you see here, I can, I, only, I can attach only to the node which, dom which dominate because otherwise I'm going to have some problem, in particular when I handle queries. So I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm restricting the locking even further. I'm also restricting something which is called path closure, which is reasonable is that on edges on the path between edges is locked, must share the same lock. So for example, here, if, 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 if I attach from, from the edge to VW, I attach U, then it means that in fact, the, 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 the edge bet, uh, which, uh, between U and V is also has to, map to, has to be mapped by the, uh, to you, and it has to be locked by the node which is locked by you. So this is a requirement on the locking. So that's another requirement is the path closure. And once again, the reason that this works has to do with aliasing, that I am restricting the aliasing, and, 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 and since I have a decomposition, it's, it's an upper bound on the aliasing, I know that I can reason about the relationship between the locks and the heap soundly. Uh, I encourage you to read more in the paper where basically we also show how you do, uh, Peter shows how you do with, how you handle sequence of operation, how you uh, handle iterators, but it all actually has to do with the fact that the heap, the heap is limited according to this decomposition. Okay, and, and how do we prevent, uh, prevent deadlock? So we do kind of standard thing. Again, we use this decomposition. We use this uh, uh, description of the memory and we enforce a topological order on the nodes. For example, here you see that we say that T is before U, before V, before W. This means that this will restrict the way that we acquire logs and it will maybe re restrict uh, concurrency, but it, guarantee, it will guarantee absence of deadlock. So for example, look how we do queries. We have this order and now we take this node and for example, we want to find all the files in the particular file system. So we acquire the lock here, then we do the lookup, and then we acquire the node here, and we, we scan the node here. And this respects the topological order, assuming that we're never gonna visit this guy U. If we're gonna visit this other guy, then it means that we, we promise that we're gonna visit it in the, in the order before it, in order to guarantee the absence of deadlock. Okay? So once we know how to do that, then in fact we can go one step farther. And this is very simple, but actually very useful. So since we know how to check that something is admissible, we don't have to have the programmer to specify the data structure. We can try. Okay? That's not very smart, but it works very well. Okay? So what do we do? We take into account that most programs are built on, on a very simple set of programs, list and, li and sync circular list. By the way, I didn't tell you, but the Linux is actually circular linked list. It doesn't matter, but it really... So, there's list, there's circular list, there's double link list, there is array, there's map, but there's but there's but there's there's, there's bound a number of these. And in the container it's it's kind of the same. So what we do, we take a workload, we assume that you have some some input in which you want your program to run. And and we basically enumerate all the decorate the composition up to a certain size. And we can just do it because we can check if a algorithmically check if a representation is adequate. And we can basically you look, this is an, a different way of data structure selection. Usually people select the data structure which, which works for all loads. We find the data structure would work for some loads. And that's an advantage or disadvantage, depending on what you want to do. But so, so that's what we do. 
So for example, I, take you, I give you a toy example. So for example, think of a depth first search. So how do you implement it? You have a source, a destination, and a weight. And there is a functional dependency that the source and the destination determines the weight. And for example, suppose you take primitive data structure like map and list. So you can enumerate them. And for example, here I'm enumerating the, the ones of, of size 4, but you can enumerate them. And that's what we do. By the way, which one of them will perform better? Do you guys know? Is there, does anybody want to? Or which will perform worst? Which one? Uh, it's a program that does that first set. So it uh, follows the, the forward on the edges until it, uh, so, so which, which one do you think performs better or worse? What's your intuition? Do you mind guessing? First one good? First one is good uh, sometimes. The, the second one is, by the way, the worst. The second one is the worst. It's terrible because nobody actually to check. Again, it's, 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 you can use it, but then it, you'd have to search all the destinations. So, so in fact, we can work with one of them, but this will be terrible. This one actually turns out to be the winner. Because what happens is that sometimes you see it, sometimes actually you need both. And you can say, why is that not a winner? Because it has to do, at least in sequential program, it has to do with memory, the fact that memory allocation is expensive. So, uh, but in the concurrent setting, in fact, this will be the better. So, so this is what we do. In the concurrent synthesis, it becomes even more interesting because we take optimal combination of <coughs> the decomposition shape, the way this shape is described, and we try the, the container data structure, different one, concurrent uh, uh, hash map, all the different one at uh, uh, the moment we work with Java. The lock placement, where do you do the lock? You can do the locks in different ways, as we say, but we assume they are all in the nodes. And there's lock implementation, how do you, you implement the lock? And finally, there is the lock scripting. How do you actually combine several locks in a, uh, in a single node in order to increase concurrency? So for example, I'm going to show you just simple data. The paper has more. So this is a, a synthetic benchmark. It's a, it's a graph. It says source and destination and a weight. And you start with an empty graph. And you, this is, by the way, something that was proposed by Neil Shavit and Maurice Hardy. It's a, it's a synthetic experiment to check a data structure. So what basically we do, we do this synthetic experiment. We sp start with an empty graph. And then each thread performs many random operations, and then we have some, some distribution. We try how many times we do successor, how many times we do processor, predecessor, how the, many times we do insert, and how many times we do remove. And the paper includes all the data, but what's interesting, in fact, one thing that you see that's interesting, the data structure really matters. It says that first there are very, very, there are big differences between the different selection of the data structure. And the second thing that you see is that the workload really matters, that there is no other clear winner. If you take different things, you find different things. Uh, and, and we just try all of them, and I just w was able to give you one. So this says, there's, this is a case that you have 35% find successor, 35% find predecessor, 20% insert, and 10% remove. And all of this, we also did the manual implementation, because we want to check sort of how does it compare to the manual implementation. So the thing that you see is that, in fact, the, the best representation that we get is usually comparable with the, with the, with the manual implementation. That's what you see. Uh, you see that several things. Here you see that this one is terrible. The reason that it's terrible is, in fact, from an asymptotic complexity because, it, you see, it hasn't the way for doing this, this. What's interesting is that you see this guy here, which performs very well in the sequential setting. It performs badly when you have more threads because it actually has some contention. Because the idea is that if you use a shared data structure and you are using the queries, you have to lock and you have some contention. The winner is this one. I don't know, but you see, it's the one which has the two representation and it has many, many locks associated with and it's a kind of coarse grain. So this is the winner in this benchmark. And as I say, if you look in different kind of things, you will find different winners. So that's interesting. It somehow tells you that you have an opportunity to try different things. OK? There's many, many related projects. And uh, 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 so the first, actually, uh, paper that we've seen that has some, some similar ideas, Cohen and Campbell. There is a work by, uh, by the University of uh, Texas, 
a lot of work. Uh, my student, Roman Manevich, actually was doing something similar and I wasn't even aware. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, uh, um, I think that the difference between our work and these work is that we use these functional dependencies and we, we, we take into account sharing. In the area of, of locking, of course, there's a lot of work, both old and new, how to use these locking, and I think there's probably uh, 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 space for more work. How do you use this locking principle, even if you're programmed by hand, in order to guarantee that you have a code which is correct in some sense, at least it's atomic or serializable and deadlock free. There's also work of trying to infer locks the, uh, by Bill McCloskey in Popel, by Mike Hicks and others. The, different, the main difference as far as I understand that these guys, they don't know how to handle the data structure. And we have this shape descriptor that we can handle and this actually would give us uh, some benefit. So the summary, this, uh, uh, the composition describes how to represent relation using containers and lock placement capture the different locking strategy. And then we have synthesis, even though Josh, Josh doesn't like the name, but synthesis is a way to explore a combination of space of the composition. And we just do uh, testing and use this admissibility. And the big idea is we can go from this low, high level language into low level representation. So if I have, I don't know if do I have a few more minutes or I can? Okay, so I want to tell you about a very... <laughs> no, no, it's... So it's, it's an attempt to solve a similar problem. It's an orthogonal approach. It is done by a guy, Greta, in collaboration with Ramalingam from Microsoft India and, and Rani Ahav. And what happened there is that, again, we want to support this multiple ADTs, not necessarily sharing, but we want to hide the synchronization complexity, and we want to compose them. We want to make them more compositional. And our trick here is to involve the programmer. Our trick is to involve the programmer, and the idea is we want the programmer to specify or to tell us, in fact, that's some idea I think I heard from Byron a long time ago, is that the programmer is, 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 is tired of writing assertion. You want to write temporal assertions. That's what the Byron told, told me, right? <laughs> or you don't remember yeah, even. I remember saying it. I don't know if it's true. But. Okay. <laughs> anyway, we are trying that in fact. So we let the programmer actually specify this thing which we call foresight. And it basically tell us how I'm going to use the operation. And then I'm going to use it in the library. So I'm going to make the implementation of the library slightly more complex. But I'm going to allow you to, I'm going to generate code which is probably correct. And, and I, the interesting thing is that even if, the, if Byron is wrong, we are still in good shape. Because what happened is that we can infer these foresight guys with static analysis. So let me give you an example. A very, very simple, completely trivial, means nothing. But it just, this example, I can give you more real examples. So what happened? Suppose I want to do these operations automati uh, atomically. And ink means increment a counter. And deck means decrement counter. And for the sake, assume that to make it a little bit more interesting, assume that this, uh, this counter is, is greater than zero. And assume also that this is implemented already correctly in the sense that increment is linearizable or whatever. But the question is, how do I force the atomicity? How do I enforce the fact that these guys and uh, these guys are, are, are together? So what do I do? And I want to do it, I want to hide it in the library. I don't want you to have to write lock because if you write a lock, you destroy everything. So I want to hide it in the library. And, and, and this is what I want to do. So the trick is, again, as, I, as I said, I use Byron. I let the programmer to specify what's going to happen. And here, the programmer specify here may use ink. And here, the programmer say he, he cannot use anything. And from that, I can actually know what to do. Because I can infer the properties based on the interface of the data structure. I don't even need to know the implementation. I need to know the interface. For example, here, think of this program. I can execute ink and ink because they always commute. There's no problem. I can even execute ink and deck because they commute under certain restrictions. So the program, so the so the library actually can actually infer infer uh, 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 how to do things. And the idea is that the, the library, the implementation of the library, will use these annotations to do a better job. Okay, so let me, again, this will give you this example. I hope it's not uh, uh, too bothering, but you see, this is what's going on here. I'm, I'm showing you the all execution, which started value zero. And I'm showing you, and I'm showing you the operation here, 
that there is this increment and decrement, increment and decrement and so on. And there is a difference between different nodes. So these are all good nodes. These nodes are here, they represent bad executions. What do I mean by bad execution? Execution which are not serializable. Okay? These guys here are also bad. Why are they bad? Because they represent an execution which, which all their successors are not serializable. So in order to avoid deadlock, I will have to prevent them. And now I'm going to have a synchronization that will do it. And how can I do it? I don't know the future, but I'm going to use Byron. The Byron tells me the future, and I'm going to check. I'm not going to check against the future. I'm going to check against the assertion that what you tell. And, and of course, this means that I, 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 I trust you that you have this assertion, but then I can use static analysis to infer this assertion, but, but I, can, I can use this assertion to generate more efficient code. And the more assertion that you give me, I'm going to generate more efficient code, but at least I, and I will, even if you're not going to give me the, the right assertion, I will maybe generate lousy code, but I will maintain this atomicity. So this is the idea. If you want to hear about it more or something else, or tell me, I'm here this week. Thank you very much. You can go to the uh, previous talk. <laughs> can we return to the slide with that chart, the performance chart? Sure. Yes. Yeah. The performance drops, uh, well, somewhere at about eight threads. Well, why does this happen? This is like due to the contention. So. Yeah. Uh, which which one of them? The 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 green guy. Well. And. The black one, the green one, actually all of them kind of... No, this one, this one here, it doesn't look like it. No, so I mean at eight. Between eight threads. Some oh, this thing here, this, this yeah. drop here. Yeah. So like the number of threads reaches the number of processors. I think so. I think the, 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 I think the, the issue is that the machine that they try in Stanford, it has eight hardware threads. That's, uh, I have to look into the paper, but I think you're right. Yeah, so the, maybe if you perform this on a, on a different uh, machine, I'm sure you can get a different answer, but that's actually say why this is an even better approach, because you don't want to pre-commit to the data structure, because you want to you wanna try it in a different thing. If you, if you are committed, if you are a Linux guy, and you have this individual <coughs> selection uh, choice, you're going to do well. So in fact, yes, sorry. Have you thought about using this for verification? So it seems like these functional descriptions might be a convenient abstract domain for representing invariants about like the level Linux code. Yeah. And so then I wondered if um, you could do some analysis and uh, automatically determine the functional descriptions be, be, from, from a given implementation rather than synthesis. To determine the functional dependencies or yeah. to, I don't know how. Uh, to to prove the functional, if you give me a functional dependency, I can do static well, to, and to discover invariants, so that, that then perhaps you could check against the specification. So to discover the functional dependency on on the low level code, yeah, or? yeah. I don't know how to do it, and uh, I'm, I I know how to uh, to check the functional dependencies and to check that they are once sure. you give them sure. and you but the functional dependency. Is a, it determines sort of a high-level property that says this file system and the file determine uh, this other thing. Or we, so I don't know how to, I know how to check them if you specify them, but I don't know how to infer them. Right. The next step check them anyway. The next step check them. Okay. <laughs> and then so there's also just a follow-up, because then um, a lot of, there, there are papers that talk about how to verify um, these kinds of complex data structures. So then I wondered if the representations of those in, I think, I guess, like separation logic kind of things are similar to the functional descriptions we get here. So my feeling, there's expert here in functional, in separation logic that you are much better, but my feeling is functional dependencies are much higher level than the separation logic or shape uh, or shape analysis or whatever. I can at least uh, talk of, because usually in shape, you saw the environment that I described in first order logic that says, I take this value and I take and the, and the functional dependency are much more in a higher level description. So uh, the, 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 the advantages and disadvantages, the, the advantage of the separation logic or first order logic with transitive flows is that you can specify anything at the lowest level possible. The relation is uh, more abstract. 
What do you see? But even not, not even restricting to the functional dependencies. I mean, you may rephrase your question just in terms of the relational presentation. Um, you could also say, well, is that basically the, the mathematical representation that you're trying to sort of you know, just do um, data structure representation stuff like 469? Mm -hmm. Rephrase the whole question that way. Um, my recollection of, say, all the garbage collector proofs is that they're not really getting things that look like these relational descriptions. It's much more, yeah, there's a higher level than the, the particular implementation, but it's still a bunch of stuff weaved together and, and um, fit with a bunch of modification. Right. You can always describe, if you want, the, the, the concrete memory is a relation, but then what you, what you gain from this approach? You can say the same, you can say that pointer is also a relation between a, a pointer and a value, but it's not... But there are things like, you know, there is a bijection between these two sets of addresses, or, you know, these, these two sets form a partition, um, and if they're stated in these terms rather than saying there is a function, to, you know, taking these two paths could land you at the same place. So it might be logically equivalent, but the formulation looks different. I So I guess one question is, what would it take to take this on to be like as powerful as a database? So what's kind of missing? Because your kind of initial motivation was this is like you're giving kind of queries on a database. Right. And so I guess join is kind of the big thing, but could this be used kind of to compile bits of database to speed them up? Or well, that's an interesting question because that's because there's a lot of research. In fact, one of the advantages of doing this research in Stanford is Stanford has such a great uh, database uh, group. And uh, Hector Garcia, I mean, you all know, and Hector is actually the inventor of the in-memory database, which is kind of similar. So there are many, many things in databases that we don't support, like persistency is a great thing for database that you can draw yeah. this thing. And it's, if, if I can do this persistence, I have no idea how to, <laughs> to make sure that you remove you, you, yeah, the, the power down and still I have the linked list in the middle of this linked list operation, the power down, and I still go back and I have the right value. I have no idea. So there's different things. But on the other hand, we show it to the database people and they, they were excited because it actually gives you a way to, to be more restrictive in a sense. We can actually go farther in a sense because we are in a programming language. We actually, <coughs> the, the adequacy is not necessarily, it's a requirement that we do now because we are lazy. But if you, if you tell me that your program, for example, only use certain queries, maybe I don't even have to represent the whole relation. Mm -hmm. But then I'll have to do much better, uh, much smarter compiler. I have to see, because we have a much more close uh, look on, the, on, the, on, the, on your program. We know that your program cannot do anything which is not written in the program. The database assume, and we are similar to the database, we are assuming a general model here. So we could do much better in the sense of say, look, this relation uh, is, is, is only used as, for example, you are, you're not doing join, or you are doing, slim, I mean, people have this no SQL or whatever, I don't know nothing about, but the idea is that they say join is bad. So we can, we can go into this world and say, look, in the, maybe we can do even better. But you're, you're right, and there's, uh, I don't know, there's probably a lot of work to do to match the, also databases, many, many interesting techniques that we didn't implement yet. But the nice thing is that we get as good as, uh, at least as what we see, what the programmers do when they write low-level data structures. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much.